This episode contains discussion about violent content and domestic violence. Listener discretion is advised. This finale is titled, The Thing Lay Still. In this episode, we welcome back our very sensitive boys and kings of the Commonwealth, Jacob Anderson and Sam Reed. Jacob Anderson, Sam Reed, thank you for coming back on the pod and gracing us with your presence. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Naomi. We have much to discuss. All right. Okay. Because I was shooketh. Okay. It was, which means I was shook <laughs> on a Shakespearean level. Okay. That's what it is to be shooketh. <laughs> and can you tell me what were each of your reactions when you read this script? I got very confused about who knows what at what <laughs> point. I did, well, actually, all I knew is that Louis knows nothing. <laughs> knows very little. I had so many questions to, for Roland when he, when it arrived because. To kill a vampire and to kill a vampire at the start, arsenic and laudanum isn't enough. You know, you do have to either behead him or, you know, drain him full of blood, then burn the body and all this kind of stuff. And so I wasn't sure, you know, are they actually trying to kill him or not? And I think that's kind of what transpires throughout the episode. Even though it's, it's not in a romantic context, this is the only like, will they, won't they in the whole season. Yeah. It's just that it's about the murder of Lestat <laughs> rather than are they going to make out or not? <laughs> Well, murder is their love language, isn't it? That absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> each other. <laughs> <laughs> mean? I mean, let's start just drop him from the height of a 747. <laughs> oh, God, don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. It's like, cloud gift. How beautiful. And then, so, you know, he's like, I'm going to drop you from the sky. It's like, well, savage, savage. Yeah. Jacob, why do you think Louis agrees to kill Lestat with Claudia? I think there, there comes a point where Louis realizes that this relationship is destroying their lives. And I kind of think he knows that the only way for he and Claudia to actually be free or have any kind of uh, semblance of freedom is they have to take him off the board. It's the only way they're going to get out of that house and out of New Orleans. And I think it's it's not something that he's comfortable with. And I think throughout episode seven, he's he's kind of constantly like on the edge of changing his mind. Mm -hmm. And he does it for Claudia, I think, more than for himself. It's interesting you say that, though, for Claudia, because if there's one thing that I got out of Seven is that, like, Claudia taking care of her damn self, okay? Claudia said, I have a plan. <laughs> you two are too messy. I'm going to have to be in control of this situation. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think what I really like also about this episode with Claudia and Lestat's relationship is that I think they are a good match for each other. And I think Lestat does respect Claudia, actually, mm -hmm. particularly once he realizes what she's done and the plan, you know, and, and, you know, as she's stomping the crap out of Antoinette's head, he sort of thinks, wow, <laughs> <Who's> this guy? <laughs> this is, she's quite That's my daughter. <laughs> yeah. That's my girl. <laughs> it's, it's a baller move from Claudia. Yes, it's a baller move, but they're also trying to kill Lestat. But he understands why he has to die or why Louis has to kill him. I mean, I think he, you know, it's like probably the only point in the whole show where he has a tiny sliver of humility, <laughs> really. You know, and he has to be like poisoned and on his knees and have a knife at his throat and kind of totally incapacitated for that to happen. And so I think he knows deep down that Claudia can actually probably give Louis maybe something that he can't give him, which is, you know, a sense of purpose, perhaps. And also, like, a sense of consistency, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Because <laughs> Lestat's definitely not consistent. No, he's very chaotic. He's <laughs> <laughs> always on his terms, whereas Louis and Claudia are fairly successful at living this kind of slightly domestic situation where they can be a family. Yeah. Sam, you talked about this moment of humility, that Lestat has. But to that, I say, Antoinette? <laughs> really? How do you think Lestat justifies this betrayal of Louis? Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, discuss. <laughs> um, look, I'm not going to try and justify. I don't think he his actions are justified. But I would say that Lestat needs to be loved. Mm-hmm. That's sort of like he needs that. He really needs adoration and worship and he needs those things. He needs, he needs, that's how he feels justification. I mean, he loves Louis, but also Louis and Claudia have their own bond that he is alienated from and he wants them to stay together. 
and he wants the family to stay together, but he also does feel a little bit left out from that bond. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he goes to Antoinette and he keeps going back to Antoinette to get that sort of adoration and um, to have that, to have a different type of relationship that he's not getting from Louis. And that's what he needs. Right. It's not great. <laughs> I wouldn't condone it. <laughs> I'm not condoning it. But but that's, you know, that's what he needs. And he does say that very early on. He, you know, he makes his point to Louis that, you know, he, sometimes he likes a little variety and he, he, he he's not saying he doesn't love him any less, but he's not necessarily a monogamous guy but he is monogamous of the heart mm, okay. <laughs> you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know i think that the main deceit is also that he said that he's killed antoinette and he and he hasn't you yeah. know that's that is that is deceitful but it also goes to show that he can't kill her mm -hmm. you know i always wonder about his relationship with her whether he really likes her or he just likes her music or you know she's a perfect vessel for him to write music through and give to her <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's so deeply fucked up. Yeah, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I know. I think that's one of the more fucked up elements of the whole show, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> he definitely finds a uh, function for Antoinette. I was wondering, like, did Lestat turn Antoinette simply to use her to, you know, listening on these conversations? You think? Because again, this all happens off screen, so it's kind of left up to us. But I wondered if it was just that, or because they do have this connection over years, and Lestat says she'll be better for us to Louis. You know, like she'll be better for our dynamic. Um, I'd say, yeah, yeah, he did do that for that reason, and I think he makes that decision up when he knows that Claudia and Louis are outside the room in episode six listening. And he says, I love you to Antoinette. And she says, I love you to Lestat because he knows they're outside the door listening. I think he makes that decision there. And then this is going to be the, the thing that gives me the power back because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now left out of this relationship. And so he, yeah, he, he's, you know, He's a user and an abuser, unfortunately. Uh, ain't that the truth? I don't know what he's talking about as well. You know, and he's like, the three of us will be much better together. I think, like, at that moment, Louis would be like, what are you talking about? Her. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I really felt like, I was like, I was like, Antoinette, you was a side piece for like 30 years. And it's like, girl, <laughs> you don't have to be in mm. the thrall of this vampire mm. man. Mm. <laughs> but this is, this is part of the trap, though, right? Of the, of the vampire bond, which I guess is, is also a proxy for love, for like deep, real love. There are so many reasons why these characters shouldn't be together. And it's probably the same for Antoinette, right? She will have a version of the vampire bond with Lestat. It might not be as deep as it is with Louis, but she's stuck in that trap. She's she's attached to him forever. Well, well until she dies, yeah. isn't? Yeah, <laughs> but like, but th I think that's why it's it's why Louis has to kill him to free his family, to free him and Claudia, but also why he can't kill him. It's like this cycle that can only really be broken with eternal death, <laughs> uh, actual real death. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. Let's talk about, though, what it takes for Louis to extricate himself from Lestat. They need to throw a huge ass party, <laughs> which means they need to step out of their vampire lair and interact with the rest of the city, which they have not done in years. Mm. So let's listen to a little clip with our dear sweet Tom Anderson. Somehow managed to survive. I didn't see it coming. I said, I thought he'd be dead by episode four. <laughs> and he the only one left. Yeah. <laughs> let's just listen to this. Oh, seeing as it's been 17 years since we've spoken, what makes you think I give a corn peppered shit? We'd like to engage your services, Mr. Anderson. We want to throw a Mardi Gras ball. Pay our respects to society before moving on. <coughs> mm, where to start? Uh, one, not in a party planning business. Two, it's January. You're a little bit behind the gun. And three, this is me and your two-tone daddies circa 1910. Just one question before I attempt your, no doubt, humiliating and reputation-destroying ask. Where do you meet the devil? And what are the terms of the agreement? Mm. Can I just, I just want to give Chris Stack a huge shout out. His Tom Anderson is incredible. Yeah, he's amazing. He's, he's distracting sometimes. 
how brilliant he is mm. and so good at kind of grounding this world, grounding some of the fantasy in, in reality. This scene, you can really feel like this could have happened. Mm. Like this could have happened and been buried. It's such a sad scene <laughs> for Tom Anderson. <laughs> I know. <laughs> also, I think what you get and what I find to be so relatable to today is you just see the extent to which people can be bought. Mm. And you see the extent to which wealthy people will let anything slide as long as they get to maintain their power. Yeah. He tries to buy eternal life yeah. in this scene. One of my favorite things that I think I didn't really realize until we were shooting that scene is that like Louis gives Tom this little smile. We tried it different ways. We did like a little wink and a little like nose tap. Mm -hmm. And it's like the tables have turned <laughs> from the beginning. This is something that Tom Anderson wants from Louis and he mm. can't have it. Yeah. I think Tom Anderson is realizing that he's going to die soon. <laughs> he's at the end of his life. And the people you step on on the way up, you're going to see him again on the way down. Yeah. And I think Louis is one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. There's also something that I feel like I clocked more in hearing this clip was that little cough from Tom Anderson, right? Mm. Just a touch of a cough. And you know, back in the day, honey, if you coughed, you were about to die. Okay. Yeah. Don't be cough. <laughs> <laughs> how much of this though, this party planning, you know, this, this long, long con, how much of this is also about getting revenge on the city in a way? Yeah. hundred percent. It's like a coming out sort of, celebration. They've been there for too long. They've overstayed their welcome. They've got all these rumors around them. And if they're going to leave, you know, they may as well have this like big, here we are, we're monsters and, and, this, and we're everything you thought we were. We'll go without the blood for three nights preceding the ball. At the ball, Louis and I will be following you, Lira, now. Maybe pluck one or two for ourselves. We'll ask them if they want to be young forever. And if they say yes? We'll pin them with one of these. Mm. Amrith. Perfection. We'll invite them to our home. We will lock the doors, shut the windows, and... <laughs> <laughs> and let the flesh instruct the mind. Let the flesh instruct the mind. Let the flesh instruct the mind. Can we talk a little bit about this party? I just love that, like, if you're going to kill Lestat... You are serving drama. You are serving one night only. You are serving quick changes. <laughs> That's the only way to get his guard down, is to give him yes. that show. Lots of costumes. That he loves yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it is actually quite joyous in that regard, even though, you know, <laughs> eating a prop baby in front of... <laughs> I, it's it was so extra. It's so extra, and I wrote, the vibe has shifted. That's yeah. what I wrote in my notes. <laughs> I was like, we're all having fun until he eats a prop baby and everyone's like, ew, <laughs> this is ruined. <laughs> you have to speak in the language of Lestat in order to disarm him. I mean, obviously, this is the double blind of the episode. It's well, so confusing to shoot because Lestat is aware of the trick right. from the very beginning. But the plan gets messy, largely because Louis is having a hard time going through with it. Mm. And it also seems like he's sad to be leaving not just Lestat, but leaving New Orleans. I think as well, for, for in terms of it being like a, a farewell to New Orleans, I think like Louis has lost touch with New Orleans. He's like become a complete hermit. He has no ties any, anymore. Mm -hmm. Part of him falling in love with Lestat again, I think he's also him falling in love with the city again. And that there's this really like bittersweet moment where Louis realizes you know, on the balcony, the, the beautiful way that, these ideas kind of coexist now. Lestat and New Orleans are synonymous with each other. It's not just about his human existence. This is like the end of the first chapter of his vampire existence. And it's really desperately sad. I think he's like devastated to be leaving the city. I'm gonna miss this place. There's not an inch of this city that wasn't built from the fierce wilderness that surrounds it. Hurricanes, floods, fevers. The damp climate on every painted sign, every stone facade. High windows through which enamel bits of civilization glitter. Silhouettes emerging, wandering out to catch a silent flash of lightning. The sucky warmth of summer rain. Desperately alike and desperately fragile. 
A last dance before the feast. I'd like that. I'd like that very much. So much would be written about that grim night in New Orleans. But not a single mention of our last hour at Latrobe's. As if the only crime unfit to print took place on that dance floor. It was my sole duty to distract Lestat. But in his mirrored eyes, the distraction reflected back onto me. And in the dead center of the whispering gallery, I lost the thread to my plotting and fell once more into the well with no bottom. I was his, and he was mine. Ugh. <laughs> Louis and Lestat kiss in front of everybody. To me, that was just emblematic of the extent to which both Louis and Lestat had lost the thread to their plotting, yeah. right? Because Ooh. they wouldn't have done that in front of everybody. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think that they, they transcend society by this point. They don't need to be a part of it. They've been a part of it because probably that's what Louis wanted and Lestat was having a good time. It was a great place to hunt, but you know, they can go anywhere and do anything. They don't need this society anymore but they really need each other. You know, Lestat's aware they're going to try and kill him. And that's what he says to him when he's talking about something else. He's saying that to him on the balcony. You know, he's saying, I know you're going to kill me. Oh, I know you're trying to kill me. But we love each other. or We did once, you know, do you want to try and do it again? And shall we dance together, you and me, alone? They're not kissing in front of anyone for anyone but themselves. And I think, you know, it's... It's it's very sad, really. It is. It's desperately sad. I'll say yeah. watching this, in that scene, there was a part of me that was like, oh, I wish they could have been that. You know? <laughs> like, I wish that had been their relationship. I think they do as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I love the disappointment as well. Like, I love the disappointment in, like, the only crime I'm fit to, to print took place on that dance floor. Mm -hmm. There's this horrific event that happens that night. And there's this one pure moment, this one loving pure thing in this room full of like dirty people there's something really clean and simple about love and that is the thing that is so loaded with shame and disgust is the the one thing that isn't hubris <laughs> that's why claudia comes in and is like remember why we're here look around you look at him yeah, I'd, again, I think it's a really, it's it's beautiful, but it's really sad. Mm -hmm. It's just, a, it's, there's so much sadness in this, in this You're episode, right. it, as crazy as it gets. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about how crazy it gets, because after this, we get to our killing scene, which is so brutal, so violent, mm -hmm. ripping off a jaw, like mauling people. <laughs> like it's, can you talk a little bit about actually shooting that? How many nights was that? How long did it take? Do you just smell like corn syrup for days? <laughs> we shot it over a long time. It was like two weeks, three weeks or something. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it was all split oh, really? up over, yeah, there was lots of different segments and we shot it over a couple of units. Yeah, and, and it felt like the beginning of the end as well, yeah. shooting that. And we spent days and days and days in these bloody shirts, which Jacob and I both still own. <laughs> but that was the only thing we took. We took from the set. It's a metaphor for the the hold that this show has over us. <laughs> I think but does like, yours does yours fold? Mine mine's so like crispy, like it's dried. Yeah, but I think mine is still just sweaty inside the plastic thing. Oh, like you, it's, I've taken it out of the plastic, yeah, so it get moldy. I didn't dry it out. <laughs> yeah. But occasionally, de depending on the weather, like mine will kind of like re dampen and it will start Ew. to like you know be movable again and then it will harden <laughs> it's a very strange Ew. object to have it's very weird it's very weird because <laughs> it's so it's, it's, it's mostly covered in mouth blood the shirt <laughs> the mouth blood is very different to the, <laughs> the body and, and clothes to blood. the body blood yeah because the, the mouth blood is sort of got corn syrup and and sweeteners in it and and it's Ugh. like sticky and <laughs> i don't know why i asked for that i think i had an idea of, of framing it i thought it'd be cool look cool in a frame yeah was that the only thing you took you know like as a little memento from your experience and the fangs. Yeah, we've got fangs. Which I don't know if we were allowed to do. But the yeah. fangs you can keep. They're for your mouth. Do you know what I mean? Like they can't reuse them for something else. Well, we can reuse them next season. Well, but sure. But they just stay with you, and then you, you pack your fangs. You pack your fangs. Go through TSA. Yeah. Go through pre-check with that. <laughs> and people are like, good lord. Oh, no. Do you know what I have? I think I have the best prop. I have Louis de Pondulac's 
American Express card. That's what? Cool. From 1976. Yeah. And Rollin texted me and was like, you asshole. <laughs> That's the one thing I wanted. He's like, it's the one thing I wanted from the show. <laughs> and kind of like, print more. You're the boss. Yeah, <laughs> sure, surely they made more than one American Express card. <laughs> I can't wait to sit down with Rollin because I'll really be able to hear him air his grievances. You know, yeah. he's going to say, Jacob took this for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was this the energy between you guys on set? I mean, you did night shoots, right? So I imagine it was like real loopy and punchy and fun. This is, this is what would you say, like 5.30 a.m. Sam and Jacob. This is, this is what happens. <laughs> oh, God. I don't know how y'all did it. Night shoots. I mean, obviously, you're doing it for so long that I'm assuming you just get used to living that reverse life, basically. No. Okay. No, you don't really you know, get used to it. That. Sometimes you do watch the show and you you know and then you remember like oh we shot that at like four o'clock in the mm. morning. Oof. Oof. It's it's surreal because you forget. But um, but we're vampires and it's important. It's so. important. Yes, it is important. But then there's there's also you have to like factor in that at a certain point you've done so many nights that it would be more destructive to do to just switch to days. So like Dubai was all shot at night. It didn't need to be, but we shot the whole thing at night partially because. I was jumping between sets, so mm -hmm. that would have been an, an actual nightmare. Right, right. <laughs> so we just were just night creatures for five, six months. My goodness, the method acting, the method acting, what had to happen, honey? Just, you know, we're talking about these crazy <laughs> nights and, you know, you guys having to live like these vampires, you know, IRL, of course, and how you would probably get a little loopy on set. And so <laughs> I'm wondering what you guys would do or how you would hang out on set is there hanging out or are you more like okay they're setting up the light i gotta go lay down i can't with you right now no we were pretty uh inseparable to be fair <laughs> there was not really there, there wasn't really any hanging out we just we just were uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> like at a certain point we just were <laughs> we didn't share a trailer but it was like a wall separating uh -huh. us and we just end up sitting on the stairs and or like texting each other <laughs> through, the, yeah. through, the wall. through the wall. <laughs> Just texting yeah. all the time. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. We became a hive mind. <laughs> we did, yeah. <laughs> Were you still a hive mind once you rapped? Were you like still like texting stuff? Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We're going to the theater tonight. <laughs> we've, like, we've, yeah. we've seen each other every day for the last, what, like week? Yeah. We're still choosing to spend time together. It's probably not very healthy. Yeah. <laughs> very codependent. No, it's beautiful. I love you too, and I love your love. <laughs> but okay, enough of this cuteness. We need to get back to the episode, which is not cute, because we still have a little more to get into, okay, before I let you boys go take your nap in your coffins. <laughs> As you both mentioned before, there is this question of who knows what when. It seems Louis don't know nothing. <laughs> and... You know, after this killing spree, we get this double reveal. Okay, both Antoinette is out here a vampire and listening to everybody. And Claudia knew this whole time Lestat's been outsmarted. Hmm. And Louis slits Lestat's throat. Let's listen to this clip. Louis. We are joined by a court. By a court that you cannot see, but it is real. It is real. I have loved you with all my soul. I'm happy it was you. You're with me. The blood poured out of him as it might never pour from a human being. All the blood he had filled himself with, he lay now on his back, his eyes staring wildly at the ceiling. The irises dancing from side to side. The thing lay still. Yeah, we know he ain't dead. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> here's a question though. Claudia says, where she's like, we have to burn him. Like, we have to burn him. And Louis basically like, I can't. I can't. Do you think this was always the plan? Meaning to just buy enough time for Louis and Claudia to get up? No. To be honest, I think Louis is, is so traumatized by the whole thing at this point that I think he's just kind of acting on instinct a lot. I don't think that he has that kind of Machiavellian sense. Mm -hmm. He's not a chess player, you know? Right. He, he's running on instinct. And I think it is just that thing that we talked about earlier, that the vampire bond is stronger than anything you could 
imagine there's there's not really an easy way to comprehend it on some level it's kind of like if if you end the start you end louis but it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint why in his guts he can't do it but it is like that's the frustrating thing right about the vampire bond you, you kind of you know it when you see it <laughs> right right yeah and i mean i think he as does actually see it as a moment of intense love as well mm. he can see that it's not easy for louis to kill him but he also accepts it you know he's not fighting it he sort of says okay right i would like to play a clip of daniel malloy talking to louis in the present day and i gotta tell you i've never had a character say something that i wanted to say to the other character so much <laughs> and that's why i love this clip <laughs> You don't need a memoir, Louis. You need a hundred sessions of EMDR. You know the shit they put soldiers through when they see one of their platoon buddies get blown up in front of them? You've only heard half the story. Stop. 144 years of life, and you're still Louis the pimp, paying a whore to sit in a room and talk with you. Because why? You got some story you want to tell the whole world about yourself? When you hear it, you'll be ashamed. Ashamed of what you say to him Please now. stop, Rashid. Ten million dollars. That's my whore number. Career's been over for years. But an honest reckoning, no. This is the same shit that happened in San Francisco. Well, Daniel Malloy's not wrong, okay? Because after this, we discover Rashid is our bond. <laughs> and I swear to God, when Louis said, the love of my life, I said, Louis, girl, you ain't learned nothing about nothing. Is Louis just one of these people who has to keep a man? Do you know what I mean? Like somebody's like, I am a chronic monogamous. Yeah. Every hundred years, I have to have a boyfriend. <laughs> Louis don't need no love of his life. Louis need to love his damn self. <laughs> Louis needs to stop <laughs> being in relationships. I, I agree. I 100% agree. Mm -hmm. When he says the love of my life, there's a little bit of a question mark in there as well. Well, sure, sure. There's an eye roll, a question mark, side <laughs> eye. What I come away with, and I think a lot of viewers, there's this question of Lestat and whether or not he is honest and the lies of omission. Yeah. But to me, this ending makes you sound to say, okay, well now, why has Louis been lying all this time? To me, I'm like, they're both unable to be honest with them, their own selves. You know what I mean? Let alone each other. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. Is it's, it's, it's protection. They're, they're protecting themselves. Right. And he needs a lot of therapy. And obviously this interview becomes that. Yeah. To a certain extent. But he's he's so traumatized at this point. His entire life has <laughs> has just been called into question. He's exposed himself in a way that he he really didn't anticipate mm. at the beginning. This has not gone the way he planned. And not only that, but I think while Daniel diagnoses it as like lying and and withholding, I think there are things that just he he blocked out. I, th mm. I think he really does believe what he's saying for the most part i think it's just that like there are moments throughout the season where he's coming to the realization that he's lying as he's doing it it's too disturbing to kind of like stop himself and go oh wait hang on no maybe that didn't happen like that because it was too painful he's he's like on the verge of an episode at this point he's He's gone. He's like, he's starting to become detached from himself. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree with Daniel, though, that maybe <laughs> he does need a bit of EDM. <laughs> Is it EDM? EDMR. EDMR. Yeah. Oh, that, that's electronic dance music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he needs a bit of a night out. He just he needs to put some headphones on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, uh, yes. Louis needs a night out. Maybe Armand can plan a nice date night for them. But this makes me wonder, though, what does the reveal of Armand as the love of Louis's life, tell us about the love that Louis and Lestat had. Because most certainly the first thing you know is that Armand has been content to spend this whole interview playing mm. what you think of as little more than a butler, right? Which we all know Lestat would have never, <laughs> okay? There is no way. Yeah, and I, <laughs> also I should add that that is a pretty big lie that he's telling, <laughs> that they're both telling for this whole time. Uh -huh. Of course, that is the <laughs> lie. That's the That's a very conscious lie. <laughs> I, yeah, and I definitely don't, I mean, you know, just to uh, stand up for the start there, I, uh, yes, yes, he wouldn't play a butler, but I don't think that is any kind of declaration of love by just saying like, sure, I'll be, I'll play your butler. So, you know, I mean, you know. No, he's he, a spy as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're right. You're right. And I'm so sorry that I'm just like, just putting Lestat through it. I'm very sorry. But <laughs> You haven't met Armand yet. Well, 
<laughs> this is the thing. This is the thing. There's so much I need to know about him. I have so many questions about Armand. <laughs> now, knowing that we have a season two coming, can you give us a little taste of what's to come? You know, certainly last we saw Lestat, he was, you know, in a garbage pile eating a rat. <laughs> and <laughs> Louis yeah. is with another messy bitch who lives for drama. <laughs> so what do we think? We have to deal with the fallout now. I th- like, I think Louis and Claudia's dynamic is going to be very interesting after this. Essentially, Claudia was trying to protect both of them and Louis threw it in her face, I guess. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, like, that's going to be an interesting thing to explore. Yeah. Sam, do you think the stat is out for blood, you know, more than usual? (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't really know. I don't really... Yeah, I don't... I mean, I know because I know what happens in this story. (laughs) (laughs) But I think what's going to be interesting is next season we're going to meet Armand. Mm. And Armand, you know, is an old vampire. He, He knows all of the vampires. So he's an interesting character to bring in because he he links a lot of other other vampires in the world to him. So yeah, I in terms of Lestat, I mean, yeah, I can't I don't know if I could just be <laughs> No, we need to stop some. Yeah. <laughs> I can feel you like you're about to uh, just stop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I just want to say you guys congratulations on a wonderful season. Congratulations on the season to come and thank you again for coming on the pod. Thank you very much. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Thanks Naomi. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> 